As day broke over the Western Inland Sea on 27 May 1942, the sun's rays slanted down on the greatest concentration of Japanese fleet strength since the start of the Pacific War. The setting was at the island of Hashirajima, which lies to the south of the well-known city of Hiroshima and southeast of the lesser-known coastal town of Iwakuni. The anchorage at Hashirajima is surrounded by hilly little islands, most of which are cultivated from water's edge to summit. Camouflaged anti-aircraft batteries atop almost every hill belied the peaceful appearance of these islands. The anchorage was large enough to accommodate the entire Japanese navy and was well off the ordinary routes of merchant ships. It was a wartime standby anchorage for combined fleet whose headquarters had been functioning in safety from a battleship group stationed there since the start of the war. It had remained there so long, in fact, that naval officers had come to speak of combined fleet headquarters simply as Hashirajima. Within the anchorage, Commander-in-Chief Combined Fleet Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto's 68,000-ton flagship, Yamato, was moored to a red buoy. Underwater cables to shore permitted instant communication with Tokyo. Gathered around Yamato were a total of 68 warships, constituting the greater part of the surface strength of the combined fleet. Admiral Yamamoto's Battleship Division 1 consisted of Yamato, Nagato and Mutsu, which with Ise, Hyuga, Fuso and Yamashiro of Battleship Division 2 made the total of seven battleships. Torpedo nets were extended around each of these giants. Pearl Harbor had impressed on us the importance of protecting ships against torpedo attacks, even in home waters. The other ships were disposed around the battleships as further protection against attacks by planes or submarines. There were light cruisers, Kitakami and Ol of Cruiser, Division 9, flagship Sendai, and 12 destroyers of Destroyer Squadron 3, 8 destroyers of Destroyer Squadron 1. Light carrier Hosho, with one destroyer and two torpedo boats and seaplane carriers, Chioda and Nishin, each of which had six midget submarines on board. All these ships and units except Battleship Division 1 belonged to the First Fleet, commanded by Vice Admiral Shiro Takasu, whose flag flew in Aise. Both the First Fleet and Battleship Division 1 had remained at Hashirajima since the outbreak of war, awaiting an opportunity for decisive surface battle. Aviators of the carrier force sarcastically referred to them as the Hashirajima Fleet. The 21 ships of our force, commanded by Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, were anchored to the north of the so-called main strength just described. To the west of us was a force under Vice Admiral Nobutake Kondo, commander of the Second Fleet. Here were heavy cruisers Atago, Kondo's flagship, and Chokai of Cruiser Division 4, Miyoko and Haguro of Cruiser Division 5, fast battleships Hiei and Kirishima of Battleship Division 3, light cruiser Yura, and seven destroyers of Destroyer Squadron 4, and light carrier Zuiho with one destroyer. The 21 ships of our force, commanded by Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, were anchored to the north of the so-called main strength just described. To the west of us was a force under Vice Admiral Nobutake Kondo, commander of the Second Fleet. Here were heavy cruisers, Atago, Kondo's flagship, and Chokai of Cruiser Division 4, Mayoko and Haguro of Cruiser Division 5, fast battleships Hiei and Kirishima of Battleship Division 3, light cruiser Yura and seven destroyers of Destroyer Squadron 4, and light carrier Zoiho with one destroyer. This massive grey armada swung silently at anchor, each ship riding low in the water under a full load of fuel and supplies taken on board at Kura in preparation for the sortie. The only traffic in the whole area consisted of chugging yellow navy tugboats which emitted heavy black smoke from their tall stacks. On board the warships there was little evidence of activity other than the occasional fluttering of signal flags as messages were exchanged. But despite the general quiet of the anchorage, one felt the excitement permeating the entire fleet. It was Navy Day, the anniversary of Admiral Togo's great victory over the Russian fleet in the Battle of Tsushima. Japan's achievements during the first six months of war in the Pacific seemed to rival that triumph of 37 years earlier. Spirits were high, 
and why not? Now we were embarking on another mission which we confidently thought would add new glory to the annals of the Imperial Navy. At 0800, Akagi's ensign was raised. Then on her signal mast went up a single flag which gave the tensely awaited order, sortie as scheduled. Standing at the flight deck control post, I turned to watch the ships of Destroyer Squadron 10. White water splashed from the anchor cables of each destroyer, washing mud from the heavy links as they dragged through the hawse holes. The destroyers soon began to move, and they were followed by Cruiser Division 8, the second section of Battleship Division 3, and Carrier Divisions 1 and 2, in that order. The Nagumo force was on its way toward the scene of one of the most significant naval actions in history. As we steamed out of the anchorage, the ships of the other forces, which would sortie two days later, gave us a rousing send-off. The crews lined the rails and cheered and waved their caps as we passed. They seemed to envy our good fortune in being the first to leave. We waved back a farewell, and a general gaiety prevailed. Every man was convinced that he was about to participate in yet another brilliant victory. Two hours later, we were halfway across the Ionida and before long would enter Bungo Strait. Beyond the strait, it was expected that we might encounter enemy submarines. Combined reports on their activities were sent out daily from Imperial General Headquarters. Latest reports indicated that a dozen or more of them were operating close to the homeland, reporting on ship movements and seeking to destroy our lines of communication. Occasionally, they would send radio reports to Pearl Harbor, and it was at such times that our scattered radio direction finders would endeavor to spot them. Akagi, the sleek aircraft carrier flagship of Admiral Nagumo, headed westward through Kudako Strait, cruising easily at 16 knots on her course toward Bungo Channel and the broad Pacific. Through scattered clouds, the sun shone brightly upon the calm blue sea. For several days, the weather had been cloudy but hot in the western inland sea, and it was pleasant now to feel the gentle breeze which swept across Akagi's flight deck. The fleet had formed a single column for the passage through the strait. Twenty-one ships in all, they cruised along at intervals of 1,000 yards, resembling for all the world a peacetime naval review. Far out in front was Rear Admiral Susumu Kimura's flagship, light cruiser Nagara, leading the 12 ships of Destroyer Squadron 10. Next came Rear Admiral Hiroaki Abe's cruiser Division 8, Tone, the flagship, and Chikuma, followed by the second section of Battleship Division 3, made up of fast battleships Haruna and Kirishima. The first section of Battleship Division 3, Hiei and Congo, had been assigned to Admiral Kondo's invasion force for this operation. Behind Kirishima came large carriers, Akagi and Kaga, comprising Carrier Division 1 under Admiral Nagumo's direct command, Rear Admiral Tamon Yamaguchi's Carrier Division 2, Hiryu and Soryu, brought up the rear, completing the Nagumo force. Presently, a dozen or so fishing boats waiting for the tide hove into sight to starboard, and their crews waved and cheered as we passed. To port the tiny island of Urashima appeared to be floating on the surface of the sea, its thick covering of green foliage set off against the dim background of Oshima. Beyond, the coast of Shikoku lay hidden in mist. As the fleet steamed on, three seaplanes of the Kure Air Corps passed overhead, their pontoons looking like oversized shoes. The planes were on their way to neutralize any enemy submarines which might be lying in wait for us outside Bungo Strait. Yashirojima soon appeared to starboard. Wheat fields, cultivated high up the mountainsides, were slightly tinged with yellow, proclaiming the nearness of summer. Offshore, a small tug belched black smoke as she struggled to pull a string of barges. We soon left them far behind as the tiny, the islands of Ominasejima and Kominasejima came into view, lying peacefully on the sea. To me, this was familiar ground. My career had started at the Japanese Naval Academy at Itajima, which lay about 20 miles to the north. In the score of intervening years, I had viewed every corner of the scenic inland sea, both from the sea and from the air, and I knew this region like a book. Now, as these familiar places passed by, 
I was lost in reminiscences which were suddenly interrupted by the loud voice of the chief signalman as he relayed an order through the voice tube. The flight deck control post, where I sat, was situated on the port side amidships. Directly forward of it rose the island which housed the bridge and the central battle command station, the ship's nerve center. At this moment, all the top-ranking officers of the striking force, as well as Akagi's own skipper and his staff, were assembled on the bridge, for regulations required all hands to be at their stations when passing through a narrow strait. Scarcely had the chief signalman ceased calling the order when four flags were quickly hoisted on the small signal mast just above the flight deck control post. The first flag indicated a manoeuvring order. Since we had now passed through the strait, I concluded, without knowing the other three flags, that the order was for all ships to move into normal cruising disposition. Atop the signal mast fluttered the flag of the striking force commander. I wondered at the vast importance which Navy men attribute to such symbols. It is the hope and dream of every naval officer someday to fly his own flag. There were almost 100 such flags in the Japanese Navy at this time, and four of them were flying in this very force. Suddenly, the ship's loudspeakers blared. Passage through strait completed. Stow gear. Restore normal condition of readiness. Men in undress whites and green work uniforms began drifting up to the flight deck to enjoy a last glimpse of the receding coastline. Some twenty communications men, their watch just completed, appeared on deck, doffed their shirts and began to exercise. Commander Minora Gender, First Air Fleet Operations Officer, came down from the bridge and joined me. A classmate of mine at the Naval Academy, he was also an aviator, and our. Friendship was of long standing. He sat down beside me on a folding chair, lit a cigarette, and said, I heard that you were ill back at Kagoshima. Are you all right now? Not so good, I replied. My stomach still bothers me occasionally. What's the trouble? Well, back at the base they sent me to an army hospital for examination, and the doctors seemed to think it was ulcers. Anyway, they told me to quit drinking for a while. Pretty rough. Aha! laughed Gender. So that's why you were on such good behaviour back at the base. That's right, I admitted, and I'm still not feeling up to par, but my flyers are in good shape. They didn't have much time for training, but they are ready and confident. I suppose you've been busy too, preparing for the sortie. It was terrific! We were supposed to wind up the southern operations and get ready for this one at the same time. We really had no time to study this operation thoroughly. Why? The chief of staff was still running round trying to put through promotions for the flyers killed in the Pearl Harbor operation. This last remark of Gender's touched on a sore point. Following the Pearl Harbor attack, the nine men who lost their lives there in midget submarines had promptly been promoted two ranks and glorified as national war heroes. The first air fleet had endeavoured to obtain similar promotions for the 55 airmen lost in the attack, but the authorities had disapproved them on the ground that there were too many. The flyers are really disgusted with that situation, I told Gender, why now the authorities are even giving the small subs credit for sinking battleship Arizona. And that's obviously ridiculous, because there was an oiler moored outboard of Arizona, so a submarine torpedo couldn't possibly have scored on her. Furthermore, the big explosion in Arizona came immediately after Kaga's second squadron of high-level bombers got two direct hits. We don't mean to discredit the midget submarines and their crews. They certainly did their part. But the morale of the air units has to be considered too. After all, they are the backbone of the fleet, and their morale would be much higher right now if the airmen's promotions had been granted before this sortie. Soryu's air officer, Commander Kusumoto, has been saying that the top echelons in Tokyo seem to be deliberately trying to discourage us. I know nodded Gender. The Naval General Staff isn't acting energetically enough and Combined Fleet Headquarters also seems to have lost some of its pre-war enthusiasm. Our own Chief of Staff seems to be the only one really sticking up for us and, instead of that, he ought to have been devoting himself exclusively to studying this operation. 
Well, at least we're sorting according to plan, I remarked. Sure. Gender laughed somewhat sarcastically. The sortie is going as scheduled. We just swallowed the combined fleet plan down whole and rushed out. The trouble is that there are several things in it that just don't add up. But then, I think the Nagumo force can handle this operation all by itself. The other forces can operate as they please. Yes, I guess you're right, I agreed. But one thing that worries me is the way information about the sortie has leaked out. Everybody seems to know of it. One officer I know was getting a shave the other day and was surprised to hear his barber remark, You're going out on a big one this time, aren't you? Barbers always have quick ears, said Gender. With so many ships docking at Kure for repairs, loading supplies and so forth, nobody in town could have helped knowing we were preparing to sortie. Also, some of our forces were rather obviously being fitted out for cold weather, with summer practically here, any fool could guess that northern operations were in prospect. I remarked on the difference in security measures between this and the Pearl Harbor operation, in which strictest precautions had been taken. It just couldn't be helped, replied Gender. Our entire fleet had to prepare for sortie on such short notice. It would have been better if the fleet could have made an intermediate move, say, to the marshals, and waited for a while until attention was diverted from them. That way, we might have kept the enemy guessing longer as to where and when we intended to strike. I asked Gender why Combined Fleet hadn't taken this factor into consideration in planning the operation. They still think the initiative is entirely in our hands, he explained. Their plans are made far in advance, based entirely on their own thinking. The result is that they will never budge from them an inch. Our attention now shifted to the plains overhead. Bungo Strait was defended by the Saiki Defence Force and the plains of the Kurin Naval Air Corps. To ensure the safe passage of our powerful task force, their entire strength had been assigned to sweep the channel and hunt out enemy submarines. But there were no alerts from either ships or planes. By noon, we had passed through the eastern channel of Bungo Strait into the deep blue waters of the Pacific and the destroyers had spread out for a swift anti-submarine sweep before assuming their positions in a ring formation. At the centre of the formation, four carriers steamed in two columns, Akagi and Kaga on the right, Hiryu and Soryu on the left. Surrounding them were two circles of screening ships. The inner circle consisted of heavy cruisers, Tone and Chikuma, disposed diagonally forward of the carriers and battleships Haruna and Kirishima diagonally to the rear. Light cruiser Nagara and twelve destroyers formed the outer circle, with Nagara out in front as the lead ship. The atmosphere was tense in every ship. Anti-submarine stations were fully manned and all hands were alert and ready for action. There was not even time for sentimental looks backward at the receding coast of the homeland. Our ships sped to the southeast, making better than twenty knots to escape possible pursuit by enemy submarines. Evening twilight soon spread over the ocean and we were cloaked in the security of darkness. No submarines had been sighted, nor was there any indication that one had observed our sortie and reported it back to base. We had passed safely through the danger area and were speeding toward our destination. Midway. Two. Evolution of Japanese naval strategy, pre-war development, to comprehend fully what lay behind the fateful sortie of the Japanese combined fleet in late May 1942, it is necessary to hark back to the strategic concepts which dominated pre-war Japanese naval thinking and to trace their evolution through the initial phase of our operations in the Pacific War. For many years prior to Pearl Harbor, it had been common knowledge among the rank and file of Japanese citizens that the Imperial Navy was building up its strength and formulating its strategy with the United States Navy as the hypothetical antagonist, while at the same time the Imperial Army based its preparedness and planning on the hypothesis of a contest with the Russian Army. This dual standard policy, however, had not always existed. Up to the close of World War I, there had been a unified one-power standard for both the fighting services. China was the hypothetical enemy until near the turn of the century. Then Tsarist Russia filled this role for roughly two decades, 
until World War I and its aftermath radically altered the international picture. Having fought on the side of the victorious Allies, Japan emerged from World War I a first-class world power and thus became the rival of her erstwhile companion-in-arms, the United States, for primacy in the Pacific. At the same time, the communist revolution in Russia reduced the threat of Russian imperialism in Asia and relegated the new Soviet state to a place of secondary importance in Japanese military planning. Accordingly, the new imperial defense policy adopted in 1918 designated the United States as potential enemy number one and the USSR as potential enemy number two for purposes of future preparedness. From that time onward, the Navy program was geared to this policy. However, it was not long before the Army, seeing in the rise of Soviet power an obstacle to its own ideas of continental expansion, again began looking upon Russia as the primary potential enemy. So began the dual standard preparedness policy which prevailed until the eve of the Pacific War. By the time I entered the Naval Academy in 1921, the Navy was already indoctrinating its future officers with the idea that the potential enemy is America. We were instructed that the Navy stood for southward advance, which meant clashing with the United States as opposed to the Army's policy of northward expansion involving friction with Russia. Thus developed the Navy's practice of sending its most promising officers to serve as naval attachés in Washington, just as the Army commonly assigned honor graduates of the Army General Staff College to duty in Moscow. Admirals Osami Nagano and Isoroku Yamamoto, who as Chief of Naval, General Staff and Commander-in-Chief, Combined Fleet respectively, were the two central figures in the Japanese Navy at the start of the Pacific War. Both had behind them tours of duty in the United States Capitol. Many others had the same experience. Consequently, I believe it can be said that almost all the high-ranking officers who occupied leading positions in the Japanese Navy for nearly two decades before Pearl Harbor were amply equipped to make an accurate evaluation of the fleet capabilities of the United States. Based on such evaluation, they formulated the defensive concept of fleet strategy which came to be the virtual tradition of the Imperial Navy. So firmly, indeed, was this concept established and maintained that it almost petrified the strategic thinking of the naval service. The defensive principle manifested itself most concretely in the special characteristics of Japanese warship construction. In the event of war, the Navy's strategists figured the superior American fleet would most probably carry the offensive into the Western Pacific and it would be the role of the Imperial Navy to intercept and attack it in waters close to the Japanese homeland. Japanese ships, therefore, should be so designed as to assure every possible advantage in this type of operation. For this purpose, it was decided to sacrifice to the limit living accommodations for the crews, defensive armament, and radius of action in order to achieve maximum offensive power and speed. The goal was to produce ships which would be individually superior to those of the enemy, even by a single gun or torpedo tube, or by a single knot of speed. Hull design also reflected the defensive concept. With light cruiser Ubari as the forerunner, the Navy began building ships whose freeboard was of almost uniform height from bow to stern, giving the deck line a peculiar, flat appearance. The reason was that ships of this design were considered best suited to operate in the rough seas surrounding the Japanese homeland. In such manner, the leaders of the navy sought to offset Japan's inability to compete in a quantitative naval armaments race with the United States by emphasizing efforts to achieve qualitative superiority of ships for the specific type of operations envisaged. At the same time, they developed special tactical systems for waging decisive fleet action in the course of interception operations, stressing employment of the balanced fleet principle with battleships as the backbone. By means of hard and unremitting training, these tactical concepts were thoroughly and uniformly inculcated throughout the fleet and a high level of proficiency in their application was developed. Tireless effort finally produced a naval establishment whose confidence in its own fighting ability was expressed in the motto, 
We rely not upon the enemies not attacking us, but upon our readiness to meet him when he comes. Japan's naval preparedness, however, remained restricted within the bounds of the defensive concept. It was designed only to ensure safety against attack and to preserve peace. Naturally, such a thought as sending the fleet out to attack distant Hawaii never entered the minds of the Navy's leaders. Nor was it ever considered that Japan could afford involvement in an international conflict which might result in her small navies being pitted single-handed against those of more than one enemy power. Toward the end of 1936, I was ordered to the Naval War College as a student. It was a critical time, for shortly thereafter Japan was to become free of the yoke of the Naval Arms Limitation Treaties. For some time past, there had been alarming outcries at home that 1936 would be a year of crisis and that it might well witness the outbreak of war between Japan and the United States. Naval rivalry was indeed a sore spot in Japanese-American relations. At the Washington Conference of 1921, Japan had strongly pressed for a fleet ratio of 7 to 10 vis-à-vis -vis the United States basing her stand on the principle that the relative strengths of the two navies should be such that each could defend itself successfully against the other, but neither could attack or menace the other. This was the so-called principle of non-menace and non-aggression. Naval experts at the time generally agreed that in fleet warfare, an invading force needed to be 50% stronger than the defending. Under the 7 to 10 ratio demanded by Japan, the United States fleet would have had only a 43% margin of superiority, in other words, not quite enough to wage an aggressive campaign. The conference, however, finally adopted a 3 to 5 ratio applicable to capital ships. Capital ships meaning battleships, since in those days, aircraft carriers were practically non-existent. This ratio gave the American fleet a 67% margin of superiority in the key battleship category and therefore, in the eyes of the Japanese Navy, made it an aggressive menace to Japan. The Navy's efforts to develop superior ship types for defense operations referred to earlier were largely spurred by this threat. In 1930, the London Naval Conference was convoked for the purpose of extending the limitation of naval armaments to categories other than capital ships. At this conference, Japan again insisted upon a ratio of 7 to 10 in global tonnage of non-capital ships for the same reasons as she had advanced earlier, but again her demands were rejected. Confronted by the unbending attitude of the other powers, Japan decided to regain her freedom by refusing to renew the naval limitation treaties upon their scheduled expiration at the end of 1936. In accordance with treaty stipulations, notice of this intention was given by the Japanese government in December 1934, two years ahead of the expiration date. Earlier in the same year, the United States had enacted the Vincent Naval Expansion Program, which it contended was necessary in view of change conditions in Europe and Asia. This program aimed at building up American fleet strength to the full limits allowed by the Washington and London Naval Treaties by 1939. Prior thereto, the United States had not built up to treaty levels, whereas the Japanese fleet was already at full authorized strength. Consequently, until the Vincent program, Japan had actually enjoyed some sense of security in spite of the treaty ratio. However, if the Vincent program were carried to completion, the United States fleet would achieve, actually as well as on paper, the 67% margin of superiority which Japanese naval strategists feared would enable it to carry out successful offensive operations against Japan. As soon as the naval limitation treaties lapsed, Japan promptly acted to counter the Vincent program. In 1937, she adopted what was known as the Morrison program, the third naval expansion undertaken by Japan since the conclusion of the Washington Treaty. Under this program, greater stress than ever was placed upon building special, superior type ships and armament designed to offset numerical inferiority. Yamato and Musashi, the world's largest and most heavily armed battleships were conceived as part of this effort. At the Naval War College, the problems of naval armament and possible war with the United States naturally came up for frequent discussion among the students. 
I particularly recall one of these debates, in which the majority of those present agreed that eventual war with America was inevitable. As usual, I seized the opportunity to voice my own pet and somewhat iconoclastic opinions. If it is accepted that war is inevitable, I asserted, our present naval preparedness policies are, in my opinion, entirely inadequate, and as long as we adhere to them, we shall never be in a position to win. The trouble is that we are trying to prepare ourselves to fight, and fight successfully, at an unforeseeable time, whenever an enemy challenge may force us to do so. But for us to maintain constantly the armaments level necessary to assure victory regardless of when the war may come is, I believe, utterly impossible. Consequently, if we are really convinced that war must come, we should ourselves determine in advance when to fight, and we should formulate a systematic, long-range plan of preparedness based on that decision. We should stick to the plan at the sacrifice of everything else, above all, avoiding involvement in war prior to the time we have fixed. Then, when the time comes and we have attained the level of preparedness necessary to assure victory, we should deliberately provoke hostilities. My thesis did not fail to evoke sharp opposition. I was accused of advocating a heretical perversion of the preparedness principle. Armaments, argued my opponents, are intended to preserve peace, not to prepare for war. Their true objective is to avoid the necessity of fighting. This, of course, was the accepted version of the preparedness theory. But there was an inconsistency in my colleagues' reasoning which I hastened to point out. How can you hold to this contention? I asked, and at the same time accept the premise that war with the United States is inevitable. Your premise itself is heretical. Japan and the United States were not particularly ordained by fate to be irreconcilable enemies. As a matter of fact, I went on, I am not opposed to the accepted concept of preparedness. What I take exception to is the manner in which we are presently carrying out our naval preparations. First of all, I think that it is meaningless to build up our armament with a view to counterbalancing that of another power. Let us assume that we were successful in expanding our armament to a point where we could fight the American fleet, our presumed antagonist, on even terms. Still, we would not have any real security, for under present conditions any war that breaks out is likely to develop into a world conflict. We may go ahead and build super battleships like Yamato and Musashi, but even they cannot give us the ability, single-handed, to come out on top in any international conflict. Therefore, I believe that Japan must also adopt a more flexible and conciliatory attitude in her foreign policy. In the second place, I consider our present naval armament policies wrong because they have not kept pace with the radical change in methods of warfare. We must abandon the idea that all we need to do is to outbuild our rivals in warships. In the future, aircraft will be the decisive factor. Conventional naval armament based on surface strength has become largely ornamental. Moreover, air warfare will be total warfare, requiring the complete mobilization of all national resources and activities. I fear, however, that our present level of national development is not far enough, advanced to enable use to achieve a security through building up our own air power. We must first have a more far-seated policy of internal development. My colleague who has listened to these remarks with painted expressions, as if to say, there he goes, spouting off again about his all-powerful air force. And so, the discussion broke off. Whatever were the shortcomings of the fleet preparedness program, the army, ever since the Manchurian incident of 1931, had successfully exploited our naval armaments as a springboard and flank protection for its continental expansion moves. In 1937, these maneuvers culminated in the so-called North China Incident, which soon developed into a full-scale Sino-Japanese war. The theatre of hostilities gradually spread southward, finally leading, in September 1940, to the forcible stationing of Japanese troops in northern Indochina. In the same month, Japan entered into a military alliance with Germany and Italy, and her relations with the United States thereafter deteriorated swiftly toward a rupture. 
By the fall of 1941, the Navy's leaders found themselves confronted by the difficult necessity of choosing between war and peace. I honestly believe that the majority of them were disposed toward peace. Pacifist sentiment was particularly strong among the elder admirals, who cautioned against blind belief in Japanese invincibility, pointing out that the wars of 1895 and 1904, instead of being the overwhelming Japanese triumphs described by propagandist historians, had actually been barely won through political as well as military efforts, as shown in the Tokyo War Crimes, Trials After Japan's Surrender, Admirals Keisuke Okada and Mitsumasa Yonai, both on the retired list in 1941, and Admiral Soemu Toyoda, still in active service, were representative spokesmen of the anti-war viewpoint. Even Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, then commander-in-chief of the combined fleet and the man to whom, above all others, the Navy looked for leadership, is known to have opposed Japan's plunging into war. On the basis of his estimate of Japan's naval strength and national resources, he gave a clear-cut warning that the fleet could not be counted upon to fight successfully for longer than a year. This hesitancy on the part of the Navy's leaders was taken as cowardice and indecision by the Army, whose primary concern had been Russia more than the United States and Britain, and by a certain section of the public who blindly believed in Japan's invincibility. Also, within the Navy itself, there was a pro-war faction which argued that Japan must take up arms or suffer slow but certain strangulation in the tightening strictures of Anglo-Dutch American economic reprisals. Ever since Japan, dazzled by German victories in Europe, had concluded the military alliance with the Axis, the United States, Great Britain and the Netherlands had applied increasing economic pressure against her. When Japanese troops moved into southern Indochina in July 1941, the three powers struck back with their most damaging blow to date, a concerted embargo on oil exports to Japan. The cutting off of oil supplies hit the Navy at its most vulnerable spot. Its reserve of 6,450,000 ,000 tonnes diminished daily and, even with the strictest economy, would be exhausted in three or four years at the most since without oil the Japanese fighting services would become powerless. Japan would be reduced to a situation in which she would have to bow to any and all demands by the Anglo-American camp. It had been hoped, when Japanese-American negotiations were begun in the spring of 1941, that a peaceful solution might be found. But as the talks dragged on with no apparent hope of achieving a mutually acceptable agreement, the war faction pointed to the disastrous effects of the oil embargo and declared that Japan must either take up arms before it was too late or else reconcile herself to eventual complete capitulation. Generally speaking, however, the overwhelming majority of naval officers stood aloof from the long and bitter controversy over the issue of war or peace leaving this fateful question to be decided on the highest level of the national political leadership. They went on pouring all their energies into augmenting the combat efficiency and readiness of the fleet. Meanwhile, since the beginning of 1941, Navy planners had been giving careful thought to a revamping of fleet strategy. It was readily apparent that the traditional concept of purely defensive operations in waters close to the Japanese homeland would not be adequate for the type of war in which Japan now seemed increasingly likely to become involved. Strategy of Initial Operations Whereas, in the past, Japanese naval strategists had thought almost exclusively in terms of an isolated contest against a single enemy, the United States they now had to remould their plans to fit Japanese participation in a multilateral world war. As an Axis ally, Japan had to count on waging simultaneous hostilities against the combined Pacific forces of the world's two strongest naval powers, Britain and the United States, not to mention Holland as well. With China, of course, Japan had already been at war since 1937. Such a large-scale conflict obviously would be a long, drawn-out struggle in which possession of ample supplies of strategic natural resources would be a vital determinant of ultimate victory. Above all, Japan would have to gain quick access to oil, 
the most vital sinew of modern warfare. Oil, therefore, was the paramount factor in shaping Japanese strategy for the initial phase of hostilities, just as it was to become later the final precipitant of Japan's decision to fight. To secure a source of oil supply, it was essential that Japan seize the rich petroleum-producing areas of Southeast Asia as soon as possible after the outbreak of war. The prompt acquisition of these areas was, accordingly, the common central objective of the Navy's war planners, but a clear-cut divergence of opinion arose between the two principal strategy-formulating organs, the Naval General Staff and Combined Fleet, as to how this could best be accomplished. The basic war plan elaborated by the Naval General Staff under Admiral Osami Nagano was the more orthodox and, superficially at least, the more cautious. Adhering firmly to the principle of maximum concentration of force, it called, in brief, for employing the bulk of the Navy's surface and air strength, including the carrier force, in a bold and direct thrust southward to capture the oil areas at the outset of hostilities. The general staff strategists thus hoped to accomplish the seizure before the main body of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, based far away at Pearl Harbor, could interfere. And if it later came out to attack, the Japanese fleet would intercept and destroy it in the Western Pacific, according to the tenets of the old defensive doctrine. While the naval general staff was planning along these lines, however, certain key officers in combined fleet were independently probing the feasibility of a much more daring and aggressive strategic plan. It is generally accepted that the basic concept of this plan originated in the mind of Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, Commander-in-Chief Combined Fleet, early in 1941. As Supreme Commander at Sea, Admiral Yamamoto was concerned above all with the potential threat posed by the strong American naval forces concentrated in the Hawaiian Islands. If, as envisaged by the naval general staff, the greater part of Japan's naval strength were committed to the invasion of the southern area without immobilizing these forces at least temporarily, Admiral Yamamoto saw serious danger that the United States might attack in the Western Pacific before the Japanese fleet could redispose itself to counter such an attack. He felt, therefore, that it was absolutely essential to eliminate this danger by striking a crippling offensive blow at the U.S. Pacific Fleet simultaneously weary the launching of the southern operations. Here was the genesis of the surprise assault on Pearl Harbor. Admiral Yamamoto confidently outlined his bold concept to Rear Admiral Takijiro Onishi, then Chief of Staff of the 11th Air Fleet, and instructed him to study its practicability. Onishi, who later was to become the organizer of the first kamikaze air units, was one of the Navy's foremost career aviators and was highly respected throughout the Naval Air Corps as a man of intelligence and foresight. He proceeded to give careful thought to Yamamoto's idea. It was clear from the beginning, however, that the only effective means of attacking the Pacific fleet within its Hawaiian base lay in the employment of the Japanese carrier force, the first air fleet, which then contained four large carriers, two small carriers, and a destroyer screen. Onishi's own organization, the 11th Air Fleet, consisted chiefly of shore-based attack planes and was obviously incapable of delivering an attack on Hawaii from bases in the Marshalls 2,000 miles away. It could be used effectively only against the Philippines and Malaya. To assist him in his study, therefore, Onishi turned to Commander Minoru Genda, a brilliant staff officer of the First Air Meet, who shared Onishi's belief in the key role of naval air power. Though short in stature, Genda was endowed with a strong fighting spirit, which was reflected in his hawk-like countenance. He had begun his naval career as a fighter pilot, and his skill and daring in that capacity had won for him and his units the nickname of the Gender Circus. Gender, however, was more than a skillful flyer. He was also an outstanding air tactician. As operations officer of the Second Combined Air Group dispatched to the Shanghai area in 1937, he had been instrumental in introducing new and vastly improved methods for mass long-range, operations by fighter aircraft. 
Later, after graduating with honours from the Naval War College, he had served two years in London as Assistant Naval Attaché for Air, an experience which further broadened his outlook. Gender's most noteworthy contributions in the realm of air tactics were the mass employment of fighters to gain control of the air, where friendly bombers were to operate, and the concerted use of several carrier task groups in a single tactical theatre. These new methods, applied so effectively in the opening phase of the Pacific War, were to become widely known in American aviation circles under the name of Genderism. In compliance with Admiral Onishi's request, Genda made an exhaustive study of whether Admiral Yamamoto's Hawaiian attack concept could be put into practical execution, finally drawing up his ideas in a full report. The report stated as its conclusion that the proposed attack could be successfully carried out, provided that the following essential conditions were met. 1. That all six of the fleet's large carriers be assigned to the operation. 2. That special care be taken to select only the most competent commanders and the best-reigned flying personnel. And 3. That complete secrecy be maintained so as to ensure the advantage of surprise. Commander Gender's report convinced Admiral Yamamoto that the idea of a carrier-borne air assault on Pearl Harbor was sound, and combined fleet pushed ahead with further concrete planning. However, when the tentative scheme was finally broached to the Naval General Staff, which had already concluded that the main strength of the fleet should be employed in the invasion of the southern area, it naturally encountered strong opposition. In support of its stand, the Naval General Staff argued that the diversion of a considerable portion of fleet strength, including virtually all available carriers, to the Pearl Harbor attack might seriously compromise the success of the southern operations. This argument, indeed, was not lacking in cogency, for few even in aviation circles then thought that shore-based air alone would suffice to cover and support the southern invasions. At the same time, there was no inclination to underestimate the strength of the American, British and Dutch naval forces in Far Eastern waters. The naval general staff critics further assailed Yamamoto's plan for the Pearl Harbor attack as being too much of a gamble because its success depended entirely upon taking the American fleet by surprise within its base. If, for any reason, this could not be accomplished, the attack would fail possibly with disastrous consequences. Nor were such doubts limited to the naval general staff. Vice Admiral Chuchi Nagumo, whose first air fleet would have to play the central role in the Hawaiian assault, himself opposed the plan at first. Nagumo concurred in the general staff contention that maximum strength should be thrown into the conquest of the oil regions to the south, as this was of primary strategic importance. He also underlined further the riskiness of the Yamamoto plan, pointing to the high vulnerability of carriers to air attack. Even a large carrier, he warned, could be quickly and effectively disabled by a few bomb hits. But Admiral Nagumo's views were not shared by all his subordinate commanders in the first air fleet. Rear Admiral Taman Yamaguchi, Commander Carrier Division 2, enthusiastically supported the Yamamoto plan. The U.S. Pacific Fleet, he argued, was the mainstay of Allied strength in the entire Pacific area, and its destruction should therefore be the first and foremost objective of Japanese strategy. Were the American fleet left free and undamaged, Japan would become unable to exploit any success in the South. Conversely, if it were destroyed at Pearl Harbor at the start of hostilities, the conquest and exploitation of the rich oil areas would become easy tasks. Admiral Yamamoto himself was firm and unbending in his insistence on the Pearl Harbor attack plan, opposed as he unquestionably was to Japan's going to war. Once that decision was taken, he would be responsible for the successful prosecution of the war at sea. The US Pacific Fleet stood out as his strongest antagonist, and therefore its destruction had to be his first and paramount mission. Thanks to the remarkable advance in naval air force capabilities, it was now possible to attack that fleet at Hawaii without waiting for it to come out to the Western Pacific. Despite the risk, 
Yamamoto could see no reason for hesitating to take the gamble. The naval general staff did not yield easily, however. Admiral Yamamoto, it is understood, finally threatened to resign as Commander-in-Chief Combined Fleet unless his plan was adopted, and he also declared himself ready to take personal command of the carrier-stricken force in the attack if Admiral Nagumo remained half-hearted. Confronted by this ultimatum, Admiral Nagano, Chief of Naval General Staff, had no choice. Records now available show that Nagano at last gave his consent at a meeting with Yamamoto in Tokyo on 3rd November 1941, only 35 days before the Pearl Harbor attack was actually delivered. Japan's fleet strategy for the opening phase of the Pacific War was now fixed. The defensive concepts of pre-war days were dead and buried. The new watchword was attack. On the political front, meanwhile, developments were rapidly pointing toward war. On 5 November, the government and high command jointly decided that Japan would take up arms if diplomatic negotiations failed to achieve a settlement by the end of November. On that same day, Admiral Yamamoto ordered Combined Fleet to make final preparations for war and issued an outline of the initial operations, including the attack on Pearl Harbor. On 7 November, a further combined fleet order tentatively fixed 8 December as the date for the start of hostilities, the Pearl Harbor attack. By 20 November, the Pearl Harbor task force of 31 ships under command of Vice Admiral Nagumo had assembled in utmost secrecy at Tankan Bay in the Kuril Islands. The assemblage consisted of a striking force of six fleet carriers, carrier divisions 1, 2 and 5 a screening force of two fast battleships, Battleship Division 3, two heavy cruisers, Cruiser Division 8, and one light cruiser and nine destroyers, Destroyer Squadron 1, an advanced patrol unit of three submarines and a fleet train of eight tankers. At 0600 on 26 November, this force sorted and headed via a devious route for a prearranged standby point at latitude 40 C set degree N, longitude 170 degree W. At this point, it was to receive final orders depending upon the ultimate decision taken on the question of whether or not to go to war. On 1st December, this decision was made, and it was for war. A combined fleet order dispatched the following day to Nagumo's eastward moving task force definitely set E. Arthur December as the date for attacking Pearl Harbor. On 3rd December, 4th December in Japan, the task force altered course southeastward and at 11.30 on the 6th, it turned due south to close the island of Oahu, increasing speed to 24 knots. In the very early morning of the 7th, with only a few hours to go before the target would be within plane striking distance, the task force received disturbing information from Tokyo. An Imperial General Headquarters Intelligence Report, received at 005 era, indicated that no carriers were at Pearl Harbor. These were to have been the top priority targets of our attack and we had counted on their being in port. All of the American carriers, as well as all heavy cruisers, had apparently put to sea, but the report indicated that a full count of battleships remained in the harbour. Despite this late-hour upset, Vice Admiral Nagumo and his staff decided that there was now no other course left but to carry out the attack as planned. The US battleships, though secondary to the carriers, were still considered an important target and there was also a faint possibility that some of the American carriers might have returned to Pearl Harbor by the time our planes struck. So the task force sped on toward its goal, every ship now tense and ready for battle. In the pre-dawn darkness of 7th of December, Nagumo's carriers reached a point 200 miles north of Pearl Harbor. The zero hour had arrived. The carriers swung into the wind, and at 0600 the first wave of the 353-plane attack force, of which I was in overall command, took off from the flight decks and headed for the target. The first wave was composed of 183 planes, level bombers, dive bombers, torpedo planes, and fighters. 
I flew in the lead plane, followed closely by 49 Type 97 level bombers under my direct command, each carrying one 800 kilogram armor piercing bomb. To starboard and slightly below flew Lieutenant Commander Shigaharu Murata of Akagi and his 40 planes from the four carriers, each carrying one torpedo slung to its fuselage. Above me and to port was a formation of 51 Type 99 carrier dive bombers led by Lieutenant Commander Kakuichi Takahashi from Shokaku. Each of these planes carried one ordinary 250-kilogram bomb. A three-group fighter escort of 43 Zeros, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Shigeru Itaya from Akagi, ranged overhead on the prowl for possible enemy opposition. The weather was far from ideal. A 20-knot northeast wind was raising heavy seas. Flying at 3,000 meters, we were above a dense cloud layer which extended down to within 1,500 meters of the water. The brilliant morning sun had just burst into sight, setting the eastern horizon aglow. One hour and 40 minutes after leaving the carriers, I knew that we should be nearing our goal. Small openings in the thick cloud cover afforded occasional glimpses of the ocean as I strained my eyes for the first sight of land. Suddenly, a long white line of breaking surf appeared directly beneath my plane. It was the northern shore of Oahu. Veering right toward the west coast of the island, we could see that the sky over Pearl Harbor was clear. Presently, the harbor itself became visible across the central Oahu plain, a film of morning mist hovering over it. I peered intently through my binoculars at the ships riding peacefully at anchor. One by one I counted them. Yes, the battleships were there all right, eight of them. But our last lingering hope of finding any carriers present was now gone. Not one was to be seen. It was 0749 when I ordered my radio man to send the command, attack. He immediately began tapping out the prearranged code signal, two, two, two. Leading the whole group, Lieutenant Commander Murata's torpedo bombers headed downward to launch their torpedoes, while Lieutenant Commander Itaya's fighters raced forward to sweep enemy fighters from the air. Takahashi's dive bomber group had climbed for altitude and was out of sight. My bombers, meanwhile, made a circuit toward Barber's Point to keep pace with the attack schedule. No enemy fighters were in the air, nor were there any gun flashes from the ground. The effectiveness of our attack was now certain, and a message, surprise attack successful, was accordingly sent to Akagi at ZO 753. The message was received by the carrier and duly relayed to the homeland, but, as I was astounded to learn later, the message from my plane was also heard directly by Nagato in Hiroshima Bay and by the general staff in Tokyo. The attack was opened with the first bomb falling on Wheeler Field, followed shortly by dive bombing attacks upon Hickam Field and the bases at Ford Island. Fearful that smoke from these attacks might obscure his targets, Lieutenant Commander Murata cut short his group's approach toward the battleships anchored east of Ford Island and released torpedoes. A series of white water spouts soon rose in the harbor. Lieutenant Commander Itaya's fighters, meanwhile, had full command of the air over Pearl Harbor. About four enemy fighters, which took off, were promptly shot down. By 0800, there were no enemy planes in the air, and our fighters began strafing the airfields. My level bombing group had entered on its bombing run toward the battleships moored to the east of Ford Island. On reaching an altitude of 3,000 meters, I had the sighting bomber take position in front of my plane. As we closed in, enemy anti-aircraft fire began to concentrate on us. Dark grey puffs burst all around. Most of them came from ships' batteries, but land batteries were also active. Suddenly my plane bounced as if struck by a club. When I looked back to see what had happened, the radio man said, The fuselage is hold and the rudder wire damaged. We were fortunate that the plane was still under control, for it was imperative to fly a steady course as we approached the target. Now it was nearly time for ready to release, and I concentrated my attention on the lead plane to note the instant his bomb was dropped. Suddenly, a cloud came between the bomb site and the target, and just as I was thinking that we had already overshot, the lead plane banked slightly and turned right toward Honolulu. We had missed the release point because of the cloud and would have to try again. While my group circled for another attempt, others made their runs. 
some trying as many as three before succeeding. We were about to begin our second bombing run when there was a colossal explosion in Battleship Row. A huge column of dark red smoke rose to 1,000 meters. It must have been the explosion of a ship's powder magazine. The shockwave was felt even in my plane, several miles away from the harbour. We began our run and met with fierce anti-aircraft concentrations. This time, the lead bomber was successful, and the other planes of the group followed suit promptly upon seeing the leader's bombs fall. I immediately lay flat on the cockpit floor and slid open a peephole cover in order to observe the fall of the bombs. I watched four bombs plummet toward the earth. The target, two battleships moored side by side, lay ahead. The bombs became smaller and smaller and finally disappeared. I held my breath until two tiny puffs of smoke flashed suddenly on the ship to the left and I shouted, Two hits! When an armor-piercing bomb with a time fuse hits the target, the result is almost unnoticeable from a great altitude. On the other hand, those which miss are quite obvious because they leave concentric waves to ripple out from the point of contact, and I saw two of these below. I presumed that it was Battleship Maryland we had hit. As the bombers completed their runs, they headed north to return to the carriers. Pearl Harbor and the air bases had been pretty well wrecked by the fierce strafings and bombings. The imposing naval array of an hour before was gone. Anti-aircraft fire had become greatly intensified, but in my continued observations I saw no enemy fighter planes. Our command of the air was unchallenged.